Israel is really fighting a war on two fronts. The first is a military campaign being waged in the occupied territories against the Palestinian people. And the second is a PR campaign being waged here in the U.S. through the American media to ensure continued support for Israel's occupation. Alon Pincus, Council General for Israel in New York and the coordinator of Israel's PR efforts, was recently quoted as saying, we are currently in a conflict with the Palestinians and engaging in a successful PR campaign is part of winning the conflict. So you could say that in addition to the military occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, Israel is also involved in an attempt to ideologically occupy the American media. American news coverage is influenced by a complex set of institutional relationships. These influences can be thought of as a series of filters through which the news must travel before it emerges in the voices of news anchors. To understand how American news media report on the Middle East conflict, we need to understand how these institutional filters operate. Among the most important of these filters are the business interests of the corporations that own the mass media, interests that extend beyond the United States and across the globe to the Middle East. The economic interests of media owners are shared by political elites, politicians and policymakers who form a second filter. These political elites have the power to access and influence mainstream media and are themselves part of a system dominated by corporate money and interests. The strategic importance of the Middle East to these two groups is reflected in media coverage of the region and of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. A third filter, Israel's own public relations efforts, further affects the coverage. The government of Israel employs some of the largest American public relations firms as image consultants to coordinate its political and media campaigns. Nine Israeli consulates help implement these PR campaigns by developing relationships with journalists and monitoring media outlets. Scores of private American organizations, both Christian and Jewish, reiterate the official line and organize grassroots opposition to any coverage deemed unfavorable to Israel. The most important of these is APAC, the American-Israeli Public Affairs Committee, widely regarded as the most powerful foreign lobby in Washington. This institutional framework of American business and political interests in combination with Israeli public relations shapes media coverage of the Middle East. At the same time, those progressive organizations opposing Israeli government policy, such as Jews Against the Occupation and Americans for Peace Now, rarely make it through these filters. Finally, if any news stories critical of Israeli policy do surface, there are a host of media watchdog groups that monitor and pressure journalists and media outlets, the most important of which is camera. You have, for example, an Israeli soldier who's on Palestinian territory shooting Palestinians. If he gets injured or killed, immediately you get the fullness of his humanity. Uh, you, you go to his funeral, you see his grieving mother or wife or child. You learn a lot, his name, his hopes, his dreams, where he came from, and so on. And yet you have, you know, hundreds and thousands of Palestinians killed. And you never get to know their name. You never get to see a, a funeral. You never, you're not exposed to the grief of the family. You don't know that these children, probably many of them were shot in their own homes, in their own backyards, or on the way to school. It doesn't matter. They become part of the abstraction. You know, uh, 400 Palestinians killed, that's it. It's a number. In the West Bank, a car explosion killed three Palestinians. Six Palestinians were killed and 45 wounded by Israeli troops in various incidents. About 20 Palestinians were killed today as Israeli warplanes, troops and tanks targeted Palestinian militants. Okay. Israeli soldiers fired on Palestinians violating the military curfew. At least four were killed. There are other ways of reporting on Palestinian victims. In fact, when you look at the British press, the ways in which the Palestinian victims are dismissed and downplayed in the American media, the ways in which their deaths are justified in American coverage, becomes even more glaring. A really clear example of this is the BBC story on six Palestinian kids killed by an Israeli booby trap and one the next day by Israeli soldiers. 
Five small bodies on their way to the grave, carried shoulder high, a martyr's funeral in Gaza for the dead schoolboys. Sources in the Israeli government and security services have admitted they were probably the victims of an Israeli booby trap. Victims who died side by side, two sets of brothers and a cousin, all members of one devastated Palestinian family, the Alastals. Naim lost his oldest son and his youngest, who was only six. Both good boys, he told me, who never gave any trouble. This Israeli minister wants a full inquiry, but claims it wasn't a civilian area. Civilians are not there. I stood that, there. That's exactly what minister, was stated. I, I stood there yesterday. This is an area where children pass to go to school. This is an area where people cultivate. I have stood there and I have seen it. Now, is it appropriate that a roadside bomb should be planted in this place? That's exactly what should be investigated. That's exactly what should be investigated. Even as he spoke, Palestinians say another child was killed in Gaza. They claim Israeli forces fired on these stone throwers, killing a 15-year-old called Wael. The army denies it. If you look at the American coverage from the same day, you'd struggle to think of it as even the same event. The report practically blames the victims for their own deaths. In Gaza, a Palestinian teenager was killed in a clash with Israeli troops following the funerals of five boys. They died Thursday when one of them kicked an unexploded tank shell.